as a hacker, you need to sort of make assumptions about what the code is and guess, but then if your assumptions are wrong, you fail. And with a debugger, you can instantly verify that an assumption is indeed correct or incorrect and quickly find the path for the answer. It's an amazing tool. Welcome to Mangtas Nation Season 2. This season is all about tech of the future. We'll be sharing real-world experiences and featuring astounding guests to help guide you in your tech journey. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. The show starts right now. Hello everyone, this is Jackie DeMenk together with Wauda Delvare and welcome to the Mangtas Nation podcast. Today, we have the pleasure of interviewing a hands-on successful software engineer, developer advocate, architect, entrepreneur, and author. He has been leading teams and delivering various solutions across tech stacks and deployment models. He is also a major open source contributor who has led key global projects around the world in his 30-year professional career. Listeners, let us all welcome the co-founder of Codename One and the author of Practical Debugging at Scale, Shai Almog. Hey Shai, thank you for being with us here Hi. today and welcome to the show. <laughs> Hi, thank you for that Hello. great introduction. <laughs> You're welcome. Now, we're very thrilled to have you here with us today and share your insights to our listeners, especially your experience. But before we dive deeper into the conversation, can you start by telling us a bit about yourself, Shai, please? So, as you said, I founded a couple of companies, wrote a few books, uh, including this, and actually I'm 50% through a new one that will come out in uh, middle of the year. Uh, mm -hmm. I did uh, formed uh, quite a few open source projects and uh, a couple of big ones as well as part of that. Uh, I worked as a consultant for well over a decade, so worked with over 100 companies, and you know, when you say consultant, people have this sort of vague uh, thing because it is a vague profession. But a technical consultant sort of needs to walk into a company and prove himself uh, and not annoy the engineers who want to prove themselves oh, that like sort of uh, why do we need that really expensive engineer telling us what to do. So it's a very technically grueling sort of work that propelled my level of experience over the years. I have a quick question before we go deeper into your mm -hmm. consulting and, and all that, right? Um, how about before all of that, Shai? Um, where were you born? How did you so, decide to step into this, you know, exciting environment of tech? <laughs> So that's a great question. Uh, so I was born in Israel and raised here. Uh, my accent's a bit weird uh, because my mother immigrated and I only spoke English initially. Uh, but then I stopped uh, because I learned everyone else was speaking Hebrew. So that's what I ended up with. And uh, as a kid at five, I got my first Sinclair uh, Spectrum computer. Uh, which was, I think, 79, 80, something like that. And uh, I just started writing uh, programs with it because there were no games. Uh, they didn't buy the cassette deck. So I started programming in BASIC back then. And it was a really easy computer to work with. And it sort of got me started. And then I started working with uh, Apple computers later on and building, uh, trying to build games and learn that sort of stuff at... Uh, at a young age, and that sort of got me hooked. I later on moved to run a BBS and do all sorts of things and got my first job at 16, uh, building computer games. And uh, that sort of from then on, you know, constantly moving between companies and, uh, and building stuff. So. 
we'll probably ahead, I was going to say we'll probably put like a link to a wiki of the Sinclair Spectrum computer in the show notes for the listeners who don't know what that is maybe also a link to like a Walkman and a cassette <laughs> what those are like yeah. you know back Stranger in the day things, feeling uh... that's my childhood <laughs> without the you know the weird monsters that's pretty much you know yeah so so if you are a technical consultant for a hundred clients right or more right mm -hmm. what do you come in for now what like like okay you built all of this you built this experience uh give a little bit more color around the type of clients that you would go through and and what you would do for them right so there were lots of uh, types of clients. Some of them just needed people to develop things that they didn't have resources. So I employed uh, quite a few developers, which I trained personally to get them, uh, give them the experience that they needed. And I focused on Java because you need a certain vertical that you're comfortable with. And I started using Java at its first beta and really fell in love with the language. Because up until then, I was very deep in C++, and I thought I loved it, but it wasn't the real thing, if you get what I mean. And when Java came out, it was so much better. And uh, I decided that it's the hot new thing, and I focused on that. And companies who were relatively new to that or didn't have the same level of experience started contacting me. And... Uh, when they ran into a problem with the JVM or with various things that they weren't able to solve, everything from uh, garbage collecting taking too long to uh, is it possible to do this on a phone with a Java phone back then or, and I'd find the appropriate workaround for that or if uh, something just didn't work correctly, performance was bad. A bank, for instance, had uh, a company that was contracting for a bank had a problem where they uh, had a process that they guaranteed in contract that it will take one second and it took seven minutes. So I came over and ran a profiler. This was literally the only thing I did. It took me a day to run the profiler because it was difficult. Their system was very complex. But I found the problem, uh, the main problem, and reduced the time from seven minutes to seven seconds in a day. And... Uh, it was worth their expense to to pay me that uh, a really excessive amount of money that I asked for to to get that to that point. And this is, by the way, an example of using a debugging tool or a profiler to sort of make money as a, as a consultant. And this is something I did quite often. But I leveraged my experience to give them the extra benefit, and this sort of created a reputation that cascaded. I never did any marketing or anything like that. I didn't have any sales department. I just, through word of mouth and through connections with friends and a social network, I sort of was able to get one customer after another after another, and these customers often took me to additional customers as a part of that job. And that's the best uh, uh, way to grow, right? Yeah, organically, yeah. word of mouth. Um, so, so before we talk a little bit about, uh, you mentioned debugging, and, and I also want to hear much more about the companies you built, right? But I think there's something, like we, there are a lot of tech listeners on this program as well. Why did you feel Java was so much better than C++? Why did you fall in love with it? And how long did you stick with it? Or are you still with it, right? I'm still with it. Some technical I'm details. <laughs> deep with it and uh, still love it all these years, uh, mm. despite all of this time, despite the fact that it's aged, but actually aged gracefully. Uh, one of the things in C++, I worked with it for years and I loved its power. The fact that you can override everything, do everything, and the complexity, it drew me in a lot. And, but then I started working on large projects. And when I worked on large projects, really large projects, you start hitting the problem of C++ that you can read code and it, and it doesn't do what it seems to be doing. You have A plus B. 
but the plus can be an operator that's overridden and you might be reading it incorrectly because the wrong operator might be invoked and things can behave rather differently than what you would expect. You spend lots of time start looking at compiler errors and sort of fighting the language to get the language to do what you would expect. And Java is much more deterministic. So when you go to large code bases and try to find something, and especially as a consultant, it's usually trivial. You look at a method and it does what it says it does. It doesn't have as many external uh, Im implications that might uh, cause things. And because of the JVM, the behavior is super consistent. I've spent uh, a, a night uh, trying to debug the problem of uh, missing elements in uh, C++ because uh, uh, only in release builds, because uh, someone returned an object that was on the stack as a reference. And you're not allowed to do that in C++. And the thing is, it worked in the debug environment fine. But in production, when you did the release, it failed badly. And this was obviously a problem. In Java, this just isn't possible. Things like that don't happen. And, um, and I, I've learned to value the simplicity and the elegance that comes with it. And the object-oriented model is stronger, simpler, and I think that's very valuable when you want to scale. I think the complexity needs to be in the API, in the additional functionality, and not in the language itself. The language should be fluid and easy. Excellent. Uh, love that summary. And I think there are a lot of people that can relate to this. <laughs> So tell us a little bit more about um, the businesses that you started and, and what so, you do exactly yeah. today. Yeah. So I've built a few things in my years because my parents were also uh, not entrepreneurs, but uh, ran a small business and everything. And it's sort of uh, the thing. But the big business that I built uh, first was the consulting company. And it was just a matter of I worked at a company and I decided I'll quit and just start consulting. And I didn't really know what I was doing, but I was lucky to do it in the 90s. And the 90s in Israel was sort of startup nation uh, uh, thing. And it, it was insane. So many startups. I consulted, I think, to seven separate uh, startups that did instant messaging. Because I don't know if you know, ICQ came from Israel. It was uh, the first big chat messaging platform. And it yeah. was sold to AOL for 300 or so million dollars, which sounds like peanuts today, but it was revolutionary. It's like yeah. four hippies sold the company for, to a major conglomerate for hundreds of millions. And, uh, and uh, it sort of created a local dream around here. And everyone started. Yeah, I still uh, remember ICQ. Um, yeah. yeah. We'll put <laughs> younger, links so to the I show notes know. as well and ICQ. <laughs> Yeah, so it's still big in Russia, by the way, if I if I understand correctly. I think uh, it was bought there, but uh, it, it it sort of created an environment where I think just the fact that I was available and knew the the current trending language was enough, and I just was able to get into lots of companies and. Uh, I also did a lot of uh, early community work to sort of market myself because I knew I would start a company. So years later, years earlier, I started uh, just participating in, in online forums and helping people you know, without any motive just to get my name out. And, uh, and my name sort of uh, became very Googleable. To this day, there's lots of Shail Mogs in Israel. Lots of them. It's a very common name, surprisingly. But I dominate Google in English uh, for, for my name <laughs> completely. You know, the first yeah. like 10 pages. Of those. And there's a CEO there. You can't find him. You know, there, there's... Uh, but it, it's important, obviously. And uh, that, that ran for years. And I worked at Sun Microsystems as well as part of that. And in lots of other companies, Sun Microsystems is a company that created Java. Uh, the JVMs there and all sorts of things of that type. And uh, during that time, I created a few things, including uh, an, a large open source project. And later on, me and my best friend 
who worked at Sun at that time, uh, we decided to leave and uh, form Codename One, which uh, was a company based on is a company based on open source pro uh, code uh, that we initially built at Sun, and uh, mm -hmm. and that's a second big company that I created with them, and uh, it's still running to this day. It's, it lets developers build mobile applications in Java or Kotlin, and it's open source and. Uh, yeah, um, th that's so it's a second. tool. So basically, it's a platform or a tool where where developers can come in and and build. Did you say mobile applications yeah. on either Java yeah. or Kotlin? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. If you're familiar with uh, Flutter, it does something similar. Uh, just did it uh, a, like six years before Flutter came around. Uh, 2012, we uh, launched it, and uh, it's. Uh, lets you compile Java bytecode into native iOS code. We wrote a JVM for iOS for, for the essentially uh, ARM machines. And we, it compiles for Windows as well, uh, UWP, all of that. It compiles to Android, which is easy because Android's already Java, so it works seamlessly. And it includes all the libraries you will need and everything to make it all seamless. It includes Macs in the cloud to so you don't need a Mac physically, you can just right click a project and say build a native application, it sends the information to the cloud and gets back a native application. And it includes uh, all of the tools you would expect integrations with the IDs with Maven with uh, uh, GUI builders, CSS support, all sorts of things like that, everything all, all in one and it's all open source in, uh, in the project. Phenomenal. Now, beyond that, right, um, what you, you basically started companies, but you also wrote books you mentioned. Um, yeah, so tell us a little bit, how do you start writing a book and why? So the first book, when I was at Sun, I, was, I wrote documentation, did a lot of blogging even before that. But uh, one of the projects that I worked on needed documentation and started working with the tech writer over there to uh, to write it because no one else had the English uh, skills at my level to be able to actually um, create something coherent or close enough to coherent so an editor can improve it because my writing isn't mm -hmm. or at least wasn't as great. And I, I've also wrote, uh, written before that, I wrote articles about developing in uh, Java for an online publication in the 90s. And uh, they're, they're still around. And knowing the level of my English uh, writing skills before, before my current level, uh, I'm, I'm so sorry for the, ed for the editor who published them because he probably had a lot of heavy lifting to do at fixing my, my writing back then. But practice makes perfect. When we started Codename One, I started blogging daily and just writing lots of things because when you're building a pl platform of this magnitude, what you need is to teach people. And I did lots of videos. I did over 25 hours of uh, video tutorials and I did... Uh, lots of uh, writing and information. Eventually, it's sort of all the documentation ended up being about a thousand pages printed. And that was just became a book as part of the documentation. The Coding One Developer Guide sort of happened just out of me writing everything that we did and explaining everything. And it sort of evolved mm. organically. And once I, we published that, uh, I started thinking about maybe we need a bit better documentation about something that's more actionable. What do people want when they want to build applications? And that became my second book. I started it as a course on how to build uh, an app like Uber. Because that, I noticed that lots of people were looking at building an, an app, a clone to Uber. And not necessarily building a real clone, but when we want to build a startup, we usually start with I want to build X with Y. I want to build, say, Airbnb for monasteries or something like that. You know, there's even, a, I think, an online site that does these sort of uh, cards against humanity sort of uh, mixes for how to build startups. So I, saw, I thought we should pick the top clones that people want to build, the sort of templates that people want to start from. 
and go from there. And I created that uh, course, and then I did the material for the course because I did the videos and everything. And I scripted the videos, and I looked at it, and I said, well, that's material for a book. So I wrote a book as well. And, uh, and uh, I talked with uh, Manning about publishing it, and they accepted, and I went through the whole process of publishing with Manning. And it, it reached marketing. And apparently the acquisition editor and the, the marketing department weren't in sync about what, uh, what the book would be. And eventually they decided to uh, not publish it and return the rights to me. Uh, although I did get to keep the, uh, the initial, uh, you know, the payment that they give it up front, um, the name. So anyway, I got, the, uh, got to keep that. Although, like a and, royalty uh, payment, is it? No, it wasn't. It's not no, royalties. No, 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 you no, get no, to something before the royalties as an author once you submit the entire book. Yep. And it comes off the, ro the royalties later on. Mm. Um, not for all uh, books, by the way. Uh, in my current book, I didn't. But it's a matter of, uh, you know, the contract with a specific company. So I just uh, pub self-published it, uh, which was very educational because I, I wanted to build a book visually that's similar to the Manning books. And they have amazing code listings. And I learned how to do that. Uh, I wrote a blog post about how I did all of the layouts there. And it was a very educational process. I used tools that were not meant for desktop publishing. And they produced a pretty, I, I'd say, brilliant uh, output that I've, I haven't seen any technical books that re reached that level of, uh, of good looks. Uh, to to say to myself, you know, to give my, myself a compliment uh, there, but it is it is very good looking, and uh, and I published that and it sold nicely. And to this day, coding one has relatively a relatively large amount of uh, location based applications, and uh, that sort of derived from that, I guess. And uh, my current book is from A Press, and they did finish the book through. And that, uh, the acquisition editor uh, contacted me. And this time, you know, we, we made sure that we were on the same page. And since I developed the entire book with them, it was all completely synchronized. And, uh, and it's uh, just out now. Although, to be fair, that acquisition editor has since quit A Press. I don't think it's me. He quit it after 27 years. But <laughs> I don't think it's my fault. But it's kind of you know, what did working you do, with a guy, Shai? and then suddenly, you know, after twenty-seven years, he quits. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that was like this is the final piece. I'm yeah, out. The, you know, it was PS good enough to say yeah. goodbye yeah. to a career. Like, <laughs> so you should have I'll stayed quit while I'm the ahead. End. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so is that practical debugging at scale? Is that the book yeah, yeah, that you're referring yeah. to? Excellent. And, so I have a lot. What, a what are you trying now. to achieve with that? So, so bef before we go to the fourth, so like the, the practical debugging at scale, right? What's the, 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 the general message? So debugging is, I, I like to tell a story about, uh, say, 26, 27 years ago, I was, you know, already pretty experienced. I, I know everything. I'm a pretty cocky young developer, very sure of myself. I'm so brilliant. And I was working <laughs> with a senior developer, and we're debugging together, and I, like, I know everything. And that guy starts doing all sorts of things in the debugger that sort of blew my mind. I didn't really realize that you could use the debugger in that way. And it kind of took me down a peg, a couple of pegs, because it's kind of a basic thing. We need to know that it was the a humbling we experience. Use exactly, and that's it's humbling. And back then, I didn't know how to be humbled properly. You know, this is something <laughs> that I had to learn. Uh, but uh, so it was humiliating back then. You know, as an old person, I'm you know, humbling's fine. You know, I don't care about anything. Yeah. But back then, it was humiliating. And, but it was a great thing. It was, I was lucky because I was exposed to the level of my ignorance. And, you know, uh, wisdom is understanding the exact level of your own ignorance. And, 
when I was exposed to that sort of void in my knowledge, that big hole, I, I quickly rushed to fill it up as much as I could. And the thing is, there's no, not that much material. There's lots of theoretical academic books about debugging, although they don't teach it in academia because you can't test it. So when you go to the university, they don't teach you how to debug. Most developers don't want to know how to debug because they treat it kind of like taking out the trash. They hold their nose and run to the door trying to throw it out, not smell anything. And, and the reason is it's, uh, you want to get rid of the bug. And the whole process of getting rid of the bug, you sort of uh, just want to get it over with. And this is something that's problematic because I've spent days debugging some things. I've, uh, and all of us have, you know, spent sleepless nights chasing an issue. So, you know, there's surveys that say debugging takes up 60% of our time. I don't know, it sounds a bit, uh, one of those statistics that you don't, that, that don't really necessarily, someone pulled it out of some way. But, I know from experience that the only times I thought, well, maybe I picked the wrong profession was either when I was sitting with someone who's truly brilliant at a level that I've never run into or when I was debugging. These are the only two times where I felt the sort of, I hate saying the word imposter syndrome because it's so overused in the recent years, but these are, these are the times where you feel so frustrated with yourself and so stupid that um, it, it, we need to improve that skill. It's something that's universal. And when I give talks about that, everyone understands what I'm talking about because everyone feels, feels stupid when they're debugging. It's humbling. And no book gives the full tools uh, over there. There are a few books, there are maybe one or two books that talk about the debugger. And even then, they get, don't go in, in depth and don't uh, cover lots of the features there. And there's some overly academic books that uh, are either somewhat out of date and also very abstract that talk too much about the process, the theoretical process. And I talk about it, but it's the theory isn't that interesting. It's simple, and most of us use it already to some degree. So. I wanted to create something that's more actionable, that takes you through the three parts. The first part is what tools do we have, how do they work, and the things, lots of things that people don't know about or have never given them that much thought. You know, like logging. Logging is precognitive debugging. It's writing down the things that you want, that you'd want to see when you're debugging later on. And people usually think about logging in the here and now and not in the future and don't think about them in the correct way. So things like that and all the debugging in the IDE. Yesterday I gave a lecture, which I gave quite a few times, and people are always shocked by that lecture because I talk about the IDE, that thing where, that place where we as developers spend all of our time writing code. And I showed the debugger in the IDE and all sorts of features that are there. And lots of developers, pretty much everyone in the room, usually doesn't know, they don't know about these, lots of these features. And it's a shame because they can make a huge, huge, huge difference in our time spent debugging. And that's just the first chapter. The book has uh, 14 of them. As I said, the first part is about the tooling and the environment. The second part is about production and the cloud and uh, the way of uh, debugging that, observability, Kubernetes, all of that stuff. And the third part is about in action, how debugging uh, sort of real world stories and how you can apply these ideas into, uh, into the project. So how to debug something related to security, to find a security vulnerability, how to learn new code. The debugger is an amazing learning tool where you can study a complex project. As a consultant, you know, I'd come to a completely new uh, project with uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of lines of code, you can't read that. That isn't a book. No human being can. So as a hacker, you need to sort of make assumptions about what the, the code is and guess, but then if your assumptions are wrong, then you, you fail. 
And with the debugger, you can instantly verify that an assumption is indeed correct or incorrect and quickly find the, the path for, for, the, for the answer. And people don't leverage that to just learn the code. They tr start reading it instead of experimenting with it. It's an amazing tool. And it's not the tool alone. There are auxiliary tools, things like S-Trace and things like that, which are spectacular, that people don't leverage enough, which I hope to change. So you say, I, I, I hear the practical, I hear the debugging, and, and I, I don't know if passion. I'm 100 the passion for sure. But when you say at scale, what are you referring to exactly? So back in the day when uh, we were starting with the uh, internet and uh, keep in mind, uh, uh, some portion of my career was done before the internet was really much of a thing. And uh, no Stack Overflow, no Google, no nothing. And actually, most of my, my career was without Stack Overflow, which was very different, I have to say. So Stack Overflow simplified lots of things, but it also made scaling uh, more relevant because now it's easier to build software, so software becomes bigger. The same thing is true with Kubernetes. So back in those days, we'd go to the server, kick it, and hear the hard drive spin. Yeah, that's observability. It's working. And today, you, you can't build any service without proper observability, without uh, not necessarily even Kubernetes, but lots of servers, lots of regions, lots of uh, different uh, systems coming together, external services that you depend on, that depend further on other services. And it becomes, it's, these things simplify some things, but make other things far more complex. So the possibilities that were opened through scaling essentially created a new form of complexity of scale that opens up issues that, we, that are much harder to debug. In the past, we used to have uh, XA transactions, which meant you could literally run a transaction between two servers thanks to the XA protocol, which was uh, one super complex thing that I always had troubles explaining when I was teaching uh, these sort of things. And, uh, but now we have eventual consistency, which is far more complex in some regards. It's, it's supposed to be simpler. It's harder. And uh, debugging issues in the midst of that is insane sometimes. So when we, we want to debug at those scales, we're faced with completely new types of issues, and that means working with uh, uh, not necessarily with the regular debugger that we use in the IDE, but rather with those external tools, uh, observability tools of uh, logging, tracing, and also uh, developer observability tools and, uh, and such. And that changes uh, the equation completely because when we talk debugging, we usually talk locally or maybe remote debugging for some cases, but even then you can't remote debug a cluster. You can't remote debug microservices all over. So debugging at scale uh, means production because production is what matters. That's what we're building basically. So if the system works perfectly locally but fails in production, then we failed. It doesn't matter that it works locally. We haven't succeeded. And that, that's the thing that matters, really, the, the scale, in, in today's world, that is. Fascinating. Uh, you mentioned Stack Overflow, right? Um, I can imagine your life, well, kind of, <laughs> before Stack Overflow. I can't relate to it. Um, but now we got ChatGPT. Uh, and... Now it's going to be the life before ChatGPT. Are you already, in my view, right? It's very early days, obviously, but what I have seen is shocking. Um, how, how, are you using uh, these type of AI tools at all already? So I, pl I play with them a bit. I'm actually not as happy as I, maybe because I ask too hard questions. Um, <laughs> So back in the day when I started, uh, I, um, 
we, I had this huge, tremendous library, and the skill that I needed was to remember that book X had in paragraphs and such and such page had this thing that was a solution, and going and it was a library filled with thousands of pages in each book, and just finding the right uh, thing. And it was a game of memory and the ability to read really, really, really fast, which is a skill that I mastered in order to do that. And this sort of flipped. Now I don't need to remember anything and just sort of search. It's sort of the same thing like using a GPS today. It's sort of removed the need to have uh, location awareness or how to navigate without it. So uh, that, that game changed. I didn't have code completion back then. There were no IDs during some of that time. So you learn to work with, uh, with the things that you have at hand. And they improve and essentially promote bigger scale. So I think tools like um, uh, Copilot and, uh, and ChatGPT and, and all of those similar tools are essentially uh, an extension of the code completion. They will make some uh, template generation easier, and uh, there's no doubt, but not that much easier because today Stack Overflow has already made a lot of that data very available and very searchable. So it, it really revolutionized things, so this will make it even more, uh, even more easy than it was before. But uh, I've ran into lots of cases where ChatGPT generates wrong answers and invalid answers and buggy answers. And the problem is that you will spend more time debugging thanks to that. So it might increase productivity in some regards, but I think if you spend more time debugging later on or reviewing the code, some of that will be negated. So I'm not sure. I guess they will improve some of that, but the problem is garbage in, garbage out. So the more people use chat GPT, the more it will parse that bad data and the more it will generate uh, bad data. So uh, it will sort of, um, it's a problem because you can't really verify that the data is correct and ChatGPT has one major flaw. It doesn't provide any references. Um, back in the, in the 90s, I worked at a company that was an AI company and I really loved working in AI and sadly I has kind of left that field. Um, I'm having thoughts about going back, but I, I don't know. Uh, anyway, one of their tools was uh, sort of a, not, not a chat, but, but uh, an, a classic AI system where you'd ask it a question and it would give you an answer similar to, to that. But the nice thing about it is that it was able to explain the answer. So you'd, uh, if the answer didn't seem to make sense, it would actually explain the logic in human language back to you. And this is hugely valuable, and uh, ChatGPT doesn't have that. And until it can actually give us references to what it's saying, then it's not that different from any idiot on the internet who says X is Y. I just today saw a chat that ChatGPT had on a social network with a, guy, with a person saying, how much is a five plus two? And it said seven, and then it says, my wife says five plus two is uh, eight. So ChatGPT says, no, it's seven, she's wrong. So the guy says, no, my wife is always right. So he says, uh, well, she's probably right about that. Uh, I'm sorry that, uh, that I made that mistake. So, you know. <laughs> I saw that one, I saw that one. Yeah, so it's, I'm, uh, you're right, it's your wife, she's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wives are always so, uh, right. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, exactly, but, but the, it went three levels deeper, Shai. <laughs> it didn't want to give the right answer anymore. Oh, you said wife, I'm out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but there were other... No, but, but it's a good point. It's a valid point. Mm -hmm. It's a valid point, yeah. right? And it's, it's a big part of AI, like the explainability of it all, right? And, yeah. and, and how the given industry the complexity... I've been quite a while and in AI. And, uh, you know, I've been through all of the promises and everything and... Uh, the problem isn't, there's lots of uh, fields within AI that are very interesting, but the problem with the training system, with uh, all the learning systems, has always been that you can't really explain 
how it got to that result. And, you, and it's harder to prove uh, IP ownership and things like that. So it creates uh, lots of problems. We need systems that provide, the reason we turn to computers and the things I personally want from computers is for them to be computers. I don't want the computer to be smart. I want it to be reliable. And when a computer drives a car for me, I want a a, it to be very consistent. I don't want it to be creative. And the same is true for everything, most of the things that it does. And there's obviously points of interface where you need some creativity. OCR is a great example where you want it to read things for you and you're willing to accept a level of errors that, that it gets there. But when it does something like write code for you, it becomes a bit of a problem. Can you trust that code? Can you trust the ownership, the IP of that code or of that text that it wrote? And this is a bit, lots of times I read stuff that it wrote and it seems very human. And I think, did it read it somewhere? Did some human actually write it first? And it sort of copied that verbatim, maybe making a few changes here and there. I can't know. And without it being able to audit itself, it's... It's got its challenges. I, 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 I do agree with it, right? And, and, and I think it's going to be really tested, right? Because right now it's still limited, right? It's what's trained based on up to 2021 or something. Um, I think there's going to be a massive cultural shift almost where we're going to have these discussions um, and people are going to get away with a lot of content that's written by this and, and, and we're going to ask very different questions than we ask in the Google era, right? Uh, it will be fascinating to follow it. It'll be fascinating. Because I, I mean, the excitement that I see with everyone is, is, is phenomenal. Like it's crazy. It's, 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 it's like yeah, Google was a bit more gradual, I felt. I mean, you, you probably have seen several revolutions more than me, but yeah. this is just yeah. whoosh, overnight. And yeah. everyone I, I is agree. like, it's very Whoa. exciting. And I'm looking forward to it taking some of the role of Google uh, away from it uh, because it's, uh, it's time. I think Google stagnated for a few decades by now and hasn't really improved since 2003 or so. And it's time for something new to come around and uh, shake that up. The problem is that um, it's not really a replacement yet. I'd like it to be a replacement and to include more auditing. Hopefully, you know, the smart people there can find a solution for that because it's, I think it's probably doable to provide some form of uh, accountability. I think in the future, Shai might be already or planning to write practical debugging AI generated code or, or any, any plans of writing that type of book, Shai? Yeah, there's a joke about uh, how AI uh, debugging works by trial and error and how that is so wrong in, in terms, I forgot how the joke goes, but it's, uh, uh, yeah, AI is impossible to debug because models fail very oddly in AI. You don't really, in learning systems, you, you don't really know that it failed. You just start getting wrong answers and you don't really know, know why. And there's nothing to step over or all of the regular tools the bugger we use during debugging sort of fail. I did some work with uh, some uh, uh, stream solution and all sorts of solutions like that that are common, common in, the, in the AI field. And we can help in some stages there, but, you know, basically it's just uh, getting into the model data and moving stuff around until it works. And it's, it's a problematic. Having field. said that, Shay, it's, yeah, it's problematic, but having said that, there's not a single human on earth that can beat a chess AI anymore, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so and, this... and, and they've come to a level, and, and I, I would almost argue, is this but transferable to most usually. other problems? Chess 
is usually, there, there's actually no, there's several AIs for chess that are based on training and they indeed do learn to some degree. Lots of the chess systems are actually scheduling systems where they just search ahead for all possible moves and pick the right option and that they can go much deeper and much further than a human being, even a grandmaster, in terms of the breadth of search and depth uh, of the number of moves. The and brute force. They can actually, yeah. hmm? Brute force, it, you mean? Yeah. So in the case of, for instance, Deep Blue that beat Kasparov, the original big thing, it, as far as I know, and I didn't work on that, but I was told by a, an expert in AI back then that it was a search system that just uh, used heuristic searches to go through uh, the tree of possible chess moves and, and pick the right move and, and beat that. You can obviously take the other approach of looking at uh, game, previous games and training through that and, uh, and hopefully getting something that's uh, more uh, a training-based system and that would also win. But I think chess is a very structured environment and in structured environments, uh, AIs work well. In uh, more free flow and larger environments where the variables are so wide, um, the constraints become uh, too too wide to define in the code for, for the training system. And then you might get results that don't make as much sense. So it's, it's harder to control the quality uh, of the results in, in those situations because the winning and losing isn't as consistent either. So for instance, for ChatGPT, how do you create a uh, uh, sort of um, quality test suite for something like that. You, you can't run something through ChatGPT and hope to always get the same result back. And I, I'm just thinking about that. It's, it's not uh, something that you can really test at the level uh, automatically that we normally test these things consistently as we retrain the model. And, uh, and it's, it's a problem. It's a problem. Here's a question, Shai. In 10 years, um, when you write a, a code from scratch, how much of it do you think you'll write yourself? So already I generate code when I create a project and I don't use AI because there's templates and there's uh, wizards that you start with. So it's already a case where I don't write. Uh, I think more will be generated. There's no question there. We'll see more and more uh, tools that do autocomplete and generate stuff. Uh, I don't think it's that much of a big deal because a relatively small amount of uh, time is spent actually writing code uh, of our daily lives. Uh, and most of that code would be relatively simple. Things like tests and things like that, it generates beautifully. And uh, because usually tests have very clear parameters of unit tests specifically, have very clear parameters to how they should look. And you can easily infer them from the actual code if you wrote the code first. Uh, obviously not the case for TDD. Uh, but um, I'm not sure how much of a difference it will make in terms of the speed of work because it will probably improve it a bit, but uh, Today with Stack Overflow and things like that, it's, it's so fast already. And I think the requirements will grow, so I, we won't feel that difference. It will sort of be taken away, right? It's like the improvements in Moore's Law and in terms of uh, stronger computers sort of get lost because we immediately find the uses for that, at that extra capacity. The same will be true for the, our capacity as programmers to to write code faster. So we won't notice it. And, and, and back to your original point, the time that you'll spend on, on checking and debugging may negate what it ultimately produces, right? Uh, yeah. Which needs to yeah. be factored in, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, although I'm, I assume these models will improve over the years. Uh, I don't think they will be perfect uh, as long as they don't change the way in which they work. Uh, which is also a possibility. You know, lots of smart people are looking at the problem 
they might find solutions to, to those problems, probably will. Well, uh, for just for like young uh, engineers now, shy who would who are dreaming of becoming a consultant, like you are reaching the the level that you've reached. What are some tips that you could give them to to advance their careers? So I'm not sure if consulting is the right way to start uh, because it's it's a challenging uh, process and you need luck in the consulting uh, industry because um, it's uh, the I was lucky to be at the right time and the right place uh, with uh, the right amount of ignorance about uh, how it shouldn't possibly work in that way to sort of just go gang ho ahead and, and be lucky. Uh, but m for most people, it doesn't work that way. And I'm not sure if that's the right uh, way to start uh, early on. Uh, lots of developers, uh, I think, would be better served by just going to a startup or something like that and gaining experience there because this is a very high stress, high yield environment where young people can um, gain more experience quickly and learn um, how, how startups really work, how, how to build these things and uh, gain that experience. After being in a couple of those startups, then uh, consulting might become more practical. Uh, and usually where you start is at companies you worked at in the past and in your third cir circle of acquaintances. That means um, generally when I got jobs, it wasn't through my friend, my direct friends, because usually I know the direct friends and they don't market you as much and don't uh, don't open up op opportunities as much. Uh, I've had the most experience and I've heard that from other people with uh, friends of friends and with people who I know and I'm connected to but uh, from a job that I did in the past or from school or from something like that. And they saw that I'm a consultant and know that I'm good at, at these sort of things and they recommended me. And pretty much most of my jobs, um, I think with the exception of one or two engagements, I got this way by a, a friend of a friend, a former customer, uh, an, an employee at a, at a company that I worked for, consulted for, uh, not direct friends, not people I would hang out with or, uh, or be, you know, cl close friends with. So the thing is to foster these sorts of um, relationships and build them over time, uh, participate in the community. And back then we didn't have meetups and things like that. So, but today, obviously, there's lots of venues to go and meet people and engage and talk with, uh, go to conferences and be active. Uh, I go to lots of these things and um, it always feels like everyone is going because I meet people constantly in these uh, things. But the reality is that a vast majority of programmers don't even bother. They don't listen to podcasts. They don't go to conferences. They don't go to meetups. They don't, they don't really extend themselves beyond school and work. And uh, that opens up an opportunity for the people willing to go that extra mile and both improve themselves and engage. Fantastic tips. Thank you, Shai. And for startups or businesses interested in connecting with you, where can they best find you or how can they best get in touch with you? So I have a blog at debugagent.com and I also have the Twitter handle debugagent.com, uh, at debugagent and uh, also on YouTube, on uh, Mastodon and on LinkedIn, I'm Shai Elmog with an I. So... And your books, those, where can um, uh, they also find your books? Everywhere where books are sold. Uh, Book Depository, Amazon, you name it. It's uh, number one you release in uh, the debugging section in Amazon. Just, just the other day, I got it. Amazing. What a great start to the year.
Thank you, Shai. Well, uh, we hope uh, to our listeners, we hope you enjoyed today's episode with Shai Almog. It was a pleasure to hear about your extensive experience, Shai, and your insights in the industry. Thank you. And, uh, well, for more information about Shai, we'll make sure to include it in the show notes uh, uh, of this episode. And uh, don't forget to tune in next time for more engaging and informative discussions with industry leaders and experts. Once again, thank you, Shai. And uh, this, you, is Jackie De- this is Jackie Demank. And Wouter Del Barre. And stay tuned for the next episode of Mangtas Nation. Thank you for tuning in to Mangtas Nation. Mangtas, your curated marketplace for B2B outsourcing solutions. Follow our social media pages to know more about us. Sign up as a client or sign up as a vendor and be part of this global B2B marketplace. Join us at www.mangtas.com. <laughs>